This is GTV. In the world of games, there is no character more prolific than Mega Man. You might call him Rockman, but however you say it, this character has appeared in more games more frequently than any other game series in history. More than Mario, or Sonic, or, well, you name it. Mega Man has them all beat. But how did Mega Man even come about? And what makes him so popular? In this episode, we'll take a look at the birth, development, and early history of the Blue Bomber. So grab an E-can and celebrate this incoming message. Mega Man is 30. On December 17, 1987, Capcom released a game known as Rockman in Japan. Soon after, this game would come to the West as Mega Man. You wouldn't know it then, but that one game would be the genesis for one of the best-selling series of all time. 30 years later, the Mega Man franchise has over a dozen spin-offs and over a hundred games overall. To cover them all would be a little too crazy, but we'll take a look at how Mega Man, the character, and the series were created and how the success of these early games laid the foundation for what Mega Man has become today. In the early 1980s, Capcom had established itself as a leader of the arcade game industry in Japan, with games like 1942 and Commando becoming big successes. As the home game market started to open up after the popularity of the Nintendo family computer, Capcom brought many of these titles home. A group of six people were given the task in early 1987 to create a unique home game, one that would set itself apart from the arcade-style games that Capcom was known for. The game's development team all contributed their parts equally, and it was not a top-down project like most games. One of those assigned to the project was planner Akira Kitamura, credited in Mega Man 1 as AK. In an interview about the early days of Mega Man, he said, Mega Man was developed in a different, special way. It wasn't made according to one mastermind's whims and fancies. It was a melting pot of ideas from different people, and I think that also helps explain its appeal. In the same interview, Kitamura explains the ground rules that were laid out for Mega Man. All of the game's stages should be cleared in an hour, and be something that players could come back to and play all over again. Players should choose whichever stage they liked in any order they wanted. Single, weak little enemies would appear in waves of three or four, and to the extent possible, avoid mixing up multiple enemies. The enemies would all use the same attack. Differences in terrain and enemy placement would adjust the difficulty of each area. The difficulty of each enemy in each wave would gradually rise, but the last enemy to appear would be easier. These gameplay rules were created in part to create a level of difficulty that would go against the conventional wisdom that games should increase in difficulty as you get closer to the end. Then came time to create the playable character, who would come to be known as Rockman, and later Mega Man. In the earliest stages of development, Kitamura had said that originally, Cutman was the hero. I imagine a game where you'd use those scissors on his head to cut down enemies and other obstacles as you progressed through the stage. After that, more and more robot masters started coming to me. After that, the idea came to him that he should create a hero capable of using different power-ups collected from the robot masters in the game. Those weapons would then exploit different weaknesses in enemies, borrowing the concept of rock-paper-scissors. While the first Mega Man game has only six Robot Masters, as opposed to eight in all the rest, there were plans originally for eight in the first game. A seventh Robot Master, Bond Man, which had the power of super glue, was on the drawing board. When the team realized that the memory size restrictions put on the game would only allow six, an eighth Robot Master never materialized. 
An interesting programming technique was used to create Mega Man on screen. His body would be one sprite and his face would be another sprite. The two objects would move together and it allowed Mega Man to break the hardware limitations given for just one sprite. It allowed for Mega Man to change his color for each power-up and the separate face sprite would blink and have facial expressions. It helped give Mega Man distinct traits that made its graphics impressive in the 80s and 90s and made it age well and look good today. Blue was chosen as the main color, simply because there were more shades of blue available on the family computer's color palette than anything else. Blue also doesn't look as being seen as too weak or too menacing as well. This design and the tricks behind it were the work of Nobuyuki Matsushima, known in the credits as HMD. Like many people in the early days of gaming, he had a background in a different field than games and came from the field of industrial machinery. In that field, one small mistake could cost lives. And so, Matsushima's strict work ethic of zero mistakes carried over to the programming of Mega Man. While a few bugs have been found, the design and movements of Mega Man are precise and flawless, thanks to him. Matsushima also had input on how Mega Man would look. He was responsible for the idea of Mega Man changing colors depending on which power-up he was using. Part of this was inspired by 1970s tokusatsu action shows, like Ninja Captor, where each hero had a specific power which is denoted by different color suits. One design aspect that was left on the cutting room floor, however, was showing the selected weapons icon in the helmet of Mega Man. This idea is retained in enemies like Cut Man and shows up in later games with Metal Man, Magnet Man, and Ring Man, for example. A space for the weapon in Mega Man's helmet is a remnant of this idea. Keiji Inafune, often referred to as the father of Mega Man, was brought into the project mid-development. His duties for the first Mega Man game were to polish up the original designs of Mega Man for print and to design enemy characters, with Yasuaki Kishimoto contributing as well. Naoya Tomita named the enemies in the first game. The music was done by Manami Matsumai, known as Chan Chakorin. Under Kitamura's direction, she developed soundtracks based on the theme of the robot master, such as Elect Man Stage having a pulse, and Cut Man Stage having a metallic drum feel. The backstory to the first Mega Man game, and the series as a whole, was given serious thought and consideration. Rockman bears a strong similarity to the 1950s anime series Mighty Atom, known in English as Astro Boy. Rule was slightly based on the anime character Candy Candy. Dr. Wily was based on Albert Einstein. And Dr. Light was designed to resemble Santa Claus. There are news articles that pop up from time to time that claim that the first Mega Man game was to be a licensed Astro Boy game, but that that deal fell through and the game was changed enough to avoid legal trouble. The characters and robotic sci-fi futuristic themes look very similar, but in a 2013 interview with Eurogamer, Keiji Inafune refutes it, stating, People are looking at the silhouette of the character and thinking it's the same. But it's really not. Is Astro Boy the same character as Mega Man? I would answer no. Many people don't know it, but there was an Astro Boy game released in February 1988 by Konami, so a licensed Astro Boy game made at this time did actually see release. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Astro Boy is heavily influenced on the classic tale of Pinocchio, and all three, Mega Man, Astro Boy, and Pinocchio, are about an elderly man building a young boy who then embarks on an adventure. Profiles for these characters were developed, even if they never made it on screen in the game until much later. Dr. Thomas Light and Dr. Albert W. Wiley met at the Robot Institute of Technology. After Dr. Light beat out Dr. Wiley for a Nobel Prize in Physics, Dr. Wiley ended their friendship and disappeared. Dr. Light began to develop and build advanced robots for different uses, including Rock as a lab assistant and Roll as a housekeeping robot. After several more robots were built, Dr. Wily reappeared, stole many of Dr. Light's robots, and reprogrammed them, making them use their special abilities to cause havoc. In order to stop them, Rock volunteered to be upgraded into Rock Man and save the world. All of these elements came together over the course of 1987, and as the year came to a close, the game was finishing up and being readied for release. On December 17, 1987, Rockman was released for the Nintendo Family Computer in Japan. The game was loved by people who had played it, but the sales were not at the level of a bestseller. 
Kitamura addressed this by saying, One of the weaknesses of Mega Man was that it didn't have a lot of shelf appeal. You wouldn't know it was fun until one actually played it. He's right. As a game with no history of being in the arcade, with gameplay styles not used before, and competing for sales with other best-selling titles, Rockman was left somewhere in the middle. Not a bomb, but not a hit. However, it was successful enough for Capcom to allow the game to go to America. When we come back, Rockman goes stateside, gets a new name, and work on a sequel gets underway. Even though in 1987 it was commonplace for a game from Japan to be released much later on in America, the wait for Mega Man stateside was actually quite fast. After the initial manufacturing order of Rockman sold out, plans were quickly put in motion to bring the game stateside. One thing that helped was that no translation was needed in the game, leaving Capcom USA the duty of localizing the game's manual and artwork. A product had already existed with the Rockman trademark in the US. The Rockman headphone amplifier was released in 1981. SR&D, maker of the Rockman amp, owned the rights to use the name Rockman. It's a great coincidence that the Rockman amp logo uses the same blue color as Mega Man's body. The decision to use the term Mega to illustrate the power of the character, as well as the catchiness of the name, ensured that the name Rockman stay in Japan forever. Capcom's then senior vice president, Joseph Marichi, created the name Mega Man, saying as a title, Rockman was horrible, so I came up with Mega Man, and they liked it enough to keep using it for the US games. Mega Man was released soon after the Japanese Rockman, and was also well received by gamers. However, while the game was liked and selling moderately in Japan and the US, Capcom had no imminent plans for a follow-up. The original team of six were upset to hear the news. In his 2011 interview, Kitamura said, I knew right away that this would become a series. The gameplay system was really well done, and I felt that it would be easy for another developer or team to make a sequel and keep that high level of quality. The team begged the management at Capcom to commission a sequel, and they did allow it, though under the condition that it be done alongside other existing projects. That meant while the rest of Capcom's 1988 and 89 lineup were being made, Mega Man 2 would be developed in the team's free time. Keiji Inafune commented about the making of the game, saying, We worked really, really hard, you know, just 20 hour days to complete this, because we were making something we wanted to make. That was the best time of my working at Capcom, because we were actually working toward a goal. We were laying it all on the line. We were doing what we wanted to do, and it really showed in the game. We put all our time and effort and love into it. Inafune would take on a larger role for Mega Man 2. He would mentor new staff members coming into the project and drove the direction of the series from then on, though Kitamura was still on board. In addition to having the team create the game on the side, they had a very short time to get it done. The development time was less than four months. Many elements from the first game were quickly reused. 
One of the things that became a staple of the series was that Capcom accepted designs for the eight robot masters in the game. In the end, over 8,000 designs had been sent in. It was a nice way to connect with fans, and very likely saved a lot of time as well. One thing that was also added were a few easter eggs that would give the game some free press, crucial for a game series on the bubble. Metal Man taking two hits of his own weapon to be defeated, and holding start and select to turn the flying stars into birds, were ways to get the game put in magazines and increase word of mouth advertising. Rockman 2, Wily no Nazo, Dr. Wily's Mystery, was released for the Nintendo Family Computer on December 24, 1988. The game was a success, and the team's hard work had been validated. The game was sent overseas to America as Mega Man 2, and was released in June 1989, and in Europe in early 1990. By then, the American market had expanded greatly. The game graced the cover of Nintendo Power and had a multi-page spread. Electronic Gaming Monthly and others had given the game positive reviews. Fans of the original game quickly picked it up. Newcomers were greeted with an amazing game that had them wondering, if this game is so great, where's part one? In the end, Mega Man 2 had sold over 1.5 million copies worldwide. Capcom had no choice but to fully embrace the series. Plans were put in motion for Rockman 3, this time with a team fully devoted to the game and ample time to make the best game possible. Kitamura would part ways with Capcom before the development of Rockman 3, and Inafune was put fully in charge and ran the series for the next 20 years. When we come back, the series expands farther than anyone ever imagined, and Mega Man comes alive in the present day. ロックマン on September 28, 1990, Rockman 3, Dr. Wily no Saigo, the end of Dr. Wily, was released in Japan for the Nintendo Family Computer. Released later in 1990 in America and in 1992 in Europe simply as Mega Man 3. Rockman 3 came to establish the character Blues, known as Proto Man in the West, and Rush, Mega Man's loyal sidekick. Much of the backstory that was previously only mentioned in game manuals was also filled in and made complete. The game was backed with a full promotional campaign and received positive reviews. Whether 2 or 3 is the better game, that's for you to decide. From then on, Mega Man would become a permanent fixture in the gaming world, and still is to this day. Three more games would be released for the family computer and NES as Mega Man 4, 5, and 6. The series expanded to the Game Boy with Dr. Wily's Revenge in 1991. Four sequels would follow. Mega Man would go 16-bit in the spin-off X series, set about a century after the original game. The mainline series would also continue on in Mega Man 7 and 8. Mega Man would go 3D for the first time in Mega Man Legends for the PlayStation. There were other unique attempts to adapt Mega Man to other games, such as Mega Man Soccer and Rockboard. The mainline series would be revived after going dark for over a decade, when in 2008, to the surprise of everyone, Mega Man 9 was announced as a throwback title, embracing the original 8-bit style of the first six games and especially recreating the gameplay and difficulty of Mega Man 2. A sequel would soon follow, and with a total of 10 numbered titles, Mega Man holds the record for the highest numbered platform game series ever. The original series, and especially the first Mega Man game, would go on to be remade and re-released, 
and since the Wiley Wars has been available on every mainstream piece of hardware since. In fact, there are so many games across so many series, only the most diehard fan would be able to name them all. To close out this video, here's a list of all of them, set to probably everyone's favorite Mega Man stage music. hope you've enjoyed this video celebrating 30 years of Mega Man. I only hope we can get another 130 or so more games between now and 2047.